And if you're dealing with mathematical reality, the gluts aren't live and the gaps aren't live. You're just going to be focusing on what we normally think of as the classical space. Um, but of course, just because many of our true theories um, focus on that classical space in no way, in no way um, demands that all of reality is accommodated only by that space. Welcome everyone to today's interview, where we are very pleased to welcome Professor J.C. Beale. He holds the O'Neill Family Chair of Philosophy at the University of Notre Dame, and his research focuses primarily on logic and the philosophy of logic. Um, his books include Possibilities and Paradox with Boss von Frassen, uh, Logical Pluralism with Greg Restall, uh, Spandrels of Truth, and among others, his most recent book, uh, The Contradictory Christ. Um, he also has a variety of published articles. Feel free to add anything, but with that, welcome and thanks so much for being here, Professor Beale. Thank you. Well, I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Um, so I want to start with a somewhat more general question, and you're perhaps most known for your defense of um, non-classical and, and subclassical logics, more, um, more specifically, and, and these are logics which are like strictly weaker than classical logics in that, well, one way to put it, I guess, is that everything um, considered valid subclassically is valid classically, but not uh, the reverse isn't true. And um, importantly, you want to allow, uh, logically speaking, um, both truth value gaps, um, propositions which are neither true nor false, and truth value gluts, um, the ones which are both true and false. Um, could you expand a bit on your view and some of the um, reasons for holding it, I guess. Yeah, um, <clears throat> well, that's right. Um, so I think of, uh, first off, I mean, the term logic gets used in all sorts of ways. So obviously there's a term to talk about the discipline, the field of logic, but um, uh, let's, we don't have to talk about the field. Um, uh, so, you know, when I use the term logic in this kind of uh, context, um, we're talking about logical consequence, um, logical validity, logical entailment, and I'll use all these synonymously. And uh, the term logic in this context as shorthand for logical consequence, logical validity, and so on. Um, now, there are, you know, there are many different entailment relations, many different consequence relations, um, uh, and you can get them in different ways, obviously, by expanding the vocabulary and so on. Um, but a very traditional view is that the logical vocabulary um, is distinct from non-logical vocabulary, um, especially extra logical vocabulary, in that it is topic neutral. Um, what exactly does that mean? Well, the way I think about it, I think is fairly traditional, but um, the way I think about it is this. Um, you know, the aim of, uh, of truth seeking um, uh, pursuits is to come up with the true and complete uh, theory of a given phenomenon. Um, and so obviously when we're talking about the true theory of salamanders, right? And um, that's gonna have one sort of vocabulary. Um, if we're talking about the true theory of um, morality or something that's going to have a different vocabulary. Talking about the true theory of arithmetic, 
that's going to have a certain vocabulary or the true theory, true set theory, um, that's going to have a vocabulary. And all that vocabulary is going to be geared towards the particular phenomenon that the theory um, is supposed to be, you know, truly and fully describing. Okay. Um, what's common in all the languages of those true theories is the logical vocabulary. It is topic neutral in the sense that it doesn't matter whether you're talking about salamanders or you're talking about morals or you're talking about you know natural numbers or sets or what have you um, that vocabulary is going to be in all of those languages and in that sense it is the topic neutral sometimes universal uh, vocabulary um, logical consequence is then the consequence or entailment or validity relation that governs that vocabulary. Um, and I take a fairly tr traditional view. Um, you know, most people have thought about what is logical vocabulary. Generally, the answers always come up with the standard first order vocabulary, shy of identity. Identity has always been controversial as to whether that is um, topic neutral, whether you really have uh, logic itself provides an identity relation for all true theories. Um, in fact, I, I think that it doesn't. Um, but generally when people have thought about the logical vocabulary, they've come up with at least the um, standard first order vocabulary. So, you know, and or uh, negation, which I think of as uh, logic's falsity operator, um, nullation, which is the sort of, it's the dual of the falsity operator. It's an invisible truth operator. Um, uh, then the, the sort of standard first order universal quantifier and existential quantifier. Um, and then logic's conditional is defined out of that stuff in the usual way, out of negation and disjunction. Um, and that's pretty much it as far as the logical vocabulary goes. It's a very, very sparse set of, of uh, pieces of vocabulary. But that's why it gets to be in all these theories, no matter what they're talking about. Um, it's, it's vocabulary that's, that's sort of minimal and thereby uh, is part of all of these true theories. Okay, so if you think of logical consequence as governing that vocabulary, and that vocabulary is universal, um, logic, logical consequence, um, is then the sort of universal consequence relation involved in every true theory. And what is it doing? Well, every true theory is gonna be closed under some consequence or validity operator, um, which is, or, or these can be interdefined. So I'll just say it can be closed under one of these, uh, some validity relation. Um, but because logic is in all the true theories, uh, logical uh, vocabulary, all true theories are gonna be closed under logical consequence. So it's the sort of bare minimum uh, closure relation for uh, true theories. Now, of course, if you closed true biology under logic and nothing else, no other entailment uh, um, relation, you would, I mean, you'd be missing a lot of consequences of true biology. The, the, the theory would just be just whatever follows by logic alone. Um, and that's, that, that, that's, you know, that's um, almost silly. Uh, to think of an analogy, think about um, uh, a theory of knowledge or what's known or think of um, necessity, a lethic necessity or something like this. Um, logic doesn't have, it's necessary that. It, logic doesn't have, um, it's known that or any of this stuff. You have to add that on. And so you have to let your consequence relation for those theories 
tell you what follows from that vocabulary. Um, so if you only closed uh, the, like the, the knowledge theory under logical vocabulary, then it simply wouldn't follow from it's known that grass is green. Grass is green just wouldn't follow according to that theory because logic doesn't recognize it's known that. These would be like two different sentences as far as logic's concerned, P and Q. And, um, so every true theory is gonna be closed under um, some consequence relation that's always gonna go beyond what logic does. Uh, but, lo but it's also gonna be closed under logic. Logic's gonna be at the bottom. All right, that's a huge picture. Um, but I hope, I hope it's clear enough. Now, you ask me, why do I think that logic provides um, the, log the possibility of gluts and the possibility of gaps? Um, uh, well, I think of it this way. Um, uh, you know, you have these two fundamental um, uh, properties in all of the relevant theories of logic, they're recognizing, you know, truth and falsity. Um, and those are mirrored, by the way, by elementary logical unary operators. It's false that and it's true that. Because the it's true that is logically redundant, it, it usually gets left out. But, um, but you yeah, have it's false that and it's true that. Now, um, when you have these two elementary properties, true and false, um, in the abstract, at least, it looks like, you know, there are four possibilities for any given sentence, right? A sentence could be, it could just have this property true, it could just have this property false, it could have both, and it might have neither. So the both would be a case of gluts, the neither would be a case of gaps. Um, now, what reason is there for ruling out those possibilities? Um, I just don't see any, frankly. I, I see no good reason for, for ruling them out. Um, some people say, well, it's the very meaning of, um, of negation that these are ruled out. But I don't, I mean, unless this is just simple sort of question begging, um, I don't see that. After all, the truth and falsity conditions for negation are, um, you know, negation P is true in a possibility if and only if P is false in that possibility. Negation P is false in a possibility if and only if the negatum, the P part is true in the possibility. In as much as the very meaning of negation are these truth and falsity conditions, um, they don't rule out gaps or gluts. After all, to get a gap, just find a possibility where P itself is neither true nor false, um, in which case its negation is neither true nor false. So the biconditional remains uh, true. Um, that is the truth and falsity conditions. Likewise for gluts. If you want, you know, uh, it's perfectly compatible with the truth and falsity conditions. If you have a possibility where P is both true and false, um, then its negation is too. Um, that's just the, the meaning of negation. But those things, the, the very meaning of negation doesn't rule out uh, gluts or gaps. So I wonder why would we? Um, and if there were a good argument, I very much want to know it. I've just never seen one. And so I just figure, why wouldn't we, why wouldn't we accept these as logical possibilities? Um, so that's a, that's a sort of big background and then a short answer to your, to your explicit question. Um, but have I answered, answered what you're asking? Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's a, that's a great um, sort of background and overview and and a brief description of the of some motivation for it. Um, and you also have um, at least one paper. I mean, one paper that I read presenting a sort of argument for subclassical logics, which you call a simple argument. And I, I, I took the structure of that to be roughly that um, um, first, 
nothing is lost um, in terms of explanatory power or something like that, or anything like that by adopting subclassical logics versus um, classical ones, uh, in part because, well, whatever explanatory power the classical logic was meant to play in various theories, we can have by or um, with like theory specific posits. Um, and so, and then on the other hand, while, while nothing is lost, something is gained in that uh, one, our theory, our logical theory is like weaker in some sense, less committing. Um, it doesn't rule out at least maybe true um, non-classical theories. And, and then there's the other motivation you mentioned in terms of um, like the notion of truth, at least conceptually admitting to gluts and gaps and, and ruling them out might seem kind of ad hoc or unmotivated. Um, is this kind of a fair characterization of your um, motivation for the view and maybe expand yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think um, so. In addition to what 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 you closed with and what I uh, just reviewed, namely, you know, it's not clear why you would give them up in the first place, since they look like possibilities. Given the you know, if we start with truth and falsity, um, um, I mentioned one argument might appeal to the very meaning of negation, but that doesn't go anywhere, um, as far as I can see. Um, so with that background, uh, yeah, the simple argument for subclassical logic. So if, if the choices are classical logic or um, uh, subclassical logic, uh, properly weaker than the classical, um, then yeah, the simple argument is simply that you lose nothing. Uh, you lose no true theories by going uh, with the subclassical account. Um, and you gain important um, uh, candidates, not only sort of in the abstract, these are viable, current, leading uh, accounts of various um, phenomena uh, that simply have to be removed as logically impossible uh, off, the, off the table uh, if you accept the classical account, which just strikes me as... Um, well, I, I don't know. It's just hard for me to get my head around how you could, how you could think that. But um, uh, let me say something on the lose no true theories um, um, part. So the simple argument is you lose no true theories and you gain some important candidates. Um, um, on the lose no true theories, um, that's right. Think about, so on the classical account of logic, remember, we're just thinking you got two candidates, classical and some suitable uh, non-class, uh, subclassical uh, account. On the classical account, it doesn't matter what theory you're, you're, you're in. Um, it doesn't matter what the phenomenon may be that you're talking about. Uh, you've got, um, no gaps. That is either either P is true or it's false that P is true, according to the theory. Um, one of those is uh, true. Um, it doesn't matter what the phenomenon may be. And, um, and that's why is that? Because we're in a classical logic, um, you know, excluded middle is... Uh, is logically valid, therefore it's valid in every true theory, because remember logic is universal, it, it's uh, every true theory is closed under it. Um, there is a slight technical thing that I should say, which is um, uh, if this junction uh, works the way you think it does, um, then um, that is, if the theory is prime, this is a technical term, um, uh, which just means that a disjunction P or Q is true in the theory, if and only if either P is true in the theory or Q is true in the theory. Um, if uh, disjunction works that way, your theory is prime, then um, you know the classical story is every single true theory um, is either not prime, so disjunction doesn't work the way you actually think it does, 
or um, uh, the theory decides P or its negation. Um, and then of course the dual is the glut case. Uh, um, according to the classical, any, any inconsistency that is in the theory takes you to the trivial theory. That is, this is a theory where every sentence in the language of the theory is true. Um, okay. This, um, uh, that's the classical story, but if we go subclassical, we don't, we, we're not forced just by logic alone to have excluded middle or its dual explosion or X false quad libet or whatever you want to call it. Um, we're not forced. But notice that if the particular phenomenon demands it, so for example, I think that mathematics, the true mathematical theories are classically closed. Um, uh, does this go against the view that, that the true account of logic is subclassical? No, it just means that for, for the mathematical reality, um, the true theory imposes excluded middle as valid according to the theory and a dually explosion as valid according to the theory. This is not logically valid. Logic won't, it's not gonna add any truths to your theory and it's only gonna add logical validities since those aren't logically valid. The theory, when you're trying to do your extra logical entailment relation tied to the theory, your extra logical consequence uh, relation, the work in that is figuring out which validities you have to add. And so mathematics just adds these. And there are various ways of doing it. Um, you basically, so if you think of all the logical possibilities, you've got all the sort of usual classical ones, then you've got the, the sort of gappy ones, that's another space, the gappy and the classical. Then you have the glutty ones, these are the true and false, um, and you have all these possibilities together, um, the classical, the classical and the gappy, um, that would be what's called strong claney logic or K3, uh, the um, uh, classical and the uh, glutty. Uh, in this context, that would be um, LP. Uh, this is uh, um, and then you take the whole space, which is what I think is the right thing to do. And um, you get what's uh, called FDE. Uh, that's the account of logic um, pioneered um, and explored very much by um, Mike Dunn, who recently passed away, sadly, and Newell Belknap. Um, OK, so you have that big space, right? Well, some logic doesn't tell you what the true theory is. It's not gonna tell you what reality demands. It's just gonna say you can't transgress these logical um, boundaries. But if you're dealing with mathematical reality, then you just simply reduce the space of possibilities. Remember when you're giving a true theory, part of what you're doing is specifying the space of theoretical possibilities, possi logical possibilities that are live with respect to the theory. And if you're dealing with mathematical reality, the gluts aren't live and the gaps aren't live. You're just gonna be focusing on what we normally think of as the classical space. Um, but of course, just because many of our true theories um, focus on that classical space in no way in no way um, demands that all of reality is accommodated only by that space. Um, anyway, that's a, a bit of a long-winded answer, but I hope it's helpful. Yeah, that, that's, that's great. Um, and I wanted to mention some, and get your thoughts on some criticisms, because um, I, I recently had the pleasure of talking with Professor Timothy Williamson and um, he, he mentioned several issues with um, rejecting, or at least what he took to be several issues with rejecting classical logic in favor of um, non-classical logics. And I took 
from that conversation, I took four different um, issues that from him. One, um, maybe we'll just start with the first one and then we can go on to the others. One is that um, a theory of being less committing is not um, necessarily a virtue of a theory and that it will be, might be more, um, might be less explanatory. And he wants to say that um, classical logics really are more explanatory than subclassical logics at least because um, they tell us more about what the world is like, what can or cannot be the case in some sense. Um, I mean, does that make sense to you? And what, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, yeah, and no, and good. Um, uh, we, yeah, so we can go through uh, each of the four that you um, took away from that conversation. Um, I should mention before I forget that um, Tim Williamson did write a paper uh, I don't remember the exact title, but um, uh, it was along some of these criticisms of uh, non-classical, but even uh, particularly subclassical logic. And um, uh, and I replied, um, I wrote a sort of response to that. Um, the title was on Williamson's new Quinean argument against non-classical logic. Um, and that paper was published in the Australasian Journal of Logic. Um, so there's the Australasian Journal of Philosophy, that's well known. Australasian Journal of Logic is where that paper is. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so less explanatory um, because it gives fewer truths. Well, um, I don't think that logic. Um, we don't think of logical consequence as giving too many explanations anyhow. Um, I mean, in as much as the vocabulary is topic neutral, you wouldn't expect that um, the relation is gonna provide a whole lot of explanation for very much. Um, it's true that in a subclassical account of logic, there are fewer logical consequences than if the, um, uh, consequence relation were stronger, um, like the classical one. You would have more logical consequences. But of course, that can't alone suggest that we're getting more explanation. I mean, after all, the trivial consequence relation, which just, you know, takes every sentence to every sentence, um, that gives you a whole lot of, of consequences. But it does so at the price of explanation. So I'm not seeing a lot of weight with this first uh, concern that you articulated. Yeah, that, that, that's a good point. I mean, um, um, I mean, maybe I'll come back to that actually, but uh, I'll start with the second one. Um, some of these are a little bit related. Um, and um, you mentioned that one thing that we want out of a, a theory of logic or or otherwise is um, unification. It should it should unify um, the various true theories that there are in some way, and a logic which says less about what's common between the true theories is thereby less unifying, and um, subclassical logic is is less unifying in that way. Um, yeah. yeah, I just I, I just don't sort of, um, obviously if, if we got precise about what the sense of un, unifying is, I suspect that there probably isn't much left to the criticism that would be um, uh, plausible with respect to logical consequence. But, um, but let me let me let me also say that um, I just again it's not clear. I mean, there's a clear sense in which logic unifies all true theories. Period. I mean, there's no getting around it. Why? Because it's the it's the validity relation, the entailment relation that governs logical vocabulary. That vocabulary is part of every true um, theory. 
Uh, and if, I mean, I don't know, are we supposed to increase the logical vocabulary to get even more somehow, you know, let all, let every language of every true theory be the same language? Is that more unification? I, I, I don't know. Um, but in any event, it's clear that logic unifies all true theories, no matter whether it's subclassical or classical. Um, just in the fact that it's the one governing the basement level topic neutral vocabulary. Um, and it's true, of course, that if you went to the weakest possible subclassical logic, um, there wouldn't be a lot of unif, I mean, you know, what's common, there'd still be common validities, logical validities. It just is true that the number of them would be fewer. Um, but, you know, my own view has been not only sort of traditional with respect to the vocabulary, but also traditional with respect to um, constraints on that vocabulary. And I've taken really the heart of logical consequence is De Morgan interaction. So, um, duels to duels. That's really what logic does. Um, and you can think of, uh, you know, logical negation as, as taking whatever it negates to the dual of that. Um, so if you have a conjunction of P and Q, then the negation takes that to the dual, which is disjunction of the duels uh, of uh, not P, not Q. Um, and, uh, and so on. In, in, in this light, double negation itself is De Morgan-like. Um, so if you, if you think of the dual of negation as um, the truth operator, uh, then um, uh, you know, the negation of the negation of P is going to take you to the truth operator. Um, okay. Um, so anyway, um, I just, I mean, what more do you want out of unification from logical vocabulary? I don't know. De Morgan seems like pretty, pretty nice unification. Um, I don't know. Uh, a lot more would have to be, be said. But I look at issues of, of important fundamental issues of unification as coming sort of after you get the topic neutral vocabulary in there. It's not that it doesn't apply to topic neutral, it's just, it's, it, it doesn't really tell one way or the other on classical subclassical as far as I can see. Yeah, yeah, I feel like this criticism, criticism is, also, is either getting at, um, is saying that like, um, you're, theory doesn't unify things in these like uninteresting ways, or it doesn't unify these th things in ways that I think they should be unified, but it's just to beg the question against your view. Um, right, because I mean, you want to say in some, on some level that um, what someone who invokes stronger logic, classical or otherwise, um, thinks is common between all two theories isn't, or at least might not be common between all two theories, right? Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And um, the, I mean, the way you put it is really what it comes down to. Again, I mean, I'd have to get, it's been a while since I looked at the one, and it may be that when you talked with Tim, his, uh, he was thinking of something else too. But um, uh, as you say, you know, it point to the way in which the classical logic account uh, provides unification that the subclassical doesn't in such a way that you're not just begging the question by saying the subclassical ought to unify by demanding explosion or demanding excluded middle or something like this. Right. Yeah, and that, and that paper by um, um, Williamson is called Alternative Logics and Applied Mathematics. I haven't had a chance to... Uh, I think that's a paper. I haven't had a chance to look at it yet, but yeah, yeah, I'd have to look back. I, he did a couple of papers, um, and I think they they sort of emerged out of. Uh, he visited um, uh, University of Connecticut when I was there, and I think I think some of that 
he was putting those together around that time, but that was some time ago. Yeah, um, fair enough. And and the third criticism was kind of a small one, but maybe you can comment on it. Um, he said that um, against maybe the idea that subclassical logics are on some level simpler, he said, well, um, you have more kind of semantic values for truths or however you might put it, like beyond just true or false, we can have true and false or neither true nor false. And at least in some respect, that's more complicated theory um, than the classical counterpart. I mean, is that much for consideration? What do you think about that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, um, I think I see the point. Um, I mean, one immediate response is, look, we all recognize the same uh, fundamental properties, right? Truth and falsity. Um, and, uh, and indeed, these are reflected in what we also recognize as the fundamental logical unary operators, uh, which is negation, nullation. Again, the fact that the truth operator is often ignored is just a reflection of the fact that it's logically redundant. Um, but um, yeah, so there's a sense in which, well, it's not really like we're disagreeing about the fundamental, but sort of grant that agreement and there's still disagreement to be had, namely the different um, logical possibilities that come out of those two. Uh, that is the different, let's say, semantic statuses that a sentence can have with respect to those two. Uh, um, and it is true um, on the account that I think is right. There are four uh, basic semantic statuses. Uh, um, you've got just true, just false, uh, you know, both and neither, um, where the both is the glutty status and the neither is the gappy. Um, does this make things more complicated? Well, I don't know. Um, I don't think so. I mean, it's exactly the same truth and falsity conditions, um, exactly in both cases. Um, now, Williamson might say, well, we can, uh, the classical person can do with just a truth property and negation and the uh, uh, conditions, the uh, truth and falsity condition, you don't need falsity conditions. You can just give truth conditions and, um, and get, the, get the whole story that way. Um, Yes, I mean, but that's a result uh, about that particular entailment relation. That's not an argument that we have different truth and falsity conditions. Um, um, the, the fundamental truth and falsity conditions are the same. And the fact that you have stronger relations that can kick away one of the conditions, the falsity conditions, to me, this is this is a result about that relation, but it's not something special about, you know, the the truth and falsity conditions um, on their own. Um, moreover, let me just say this on the thing that that this this subclassical account complicates things by by recognizing a broader space of possibilities. So not a different not different truth and falsity conditions or anything. A broader space of possibilities. Um, here, it's hard to know how to take this point because, I mean, I don't think that I've added anything to logical space. I think I just recognize what's out there. And um, uh, I think that these glutty possibilities and gappy possibilities are out there. They're just possibilities that arise from truth and falsity that we both recognize. And so if it's more complicated, well, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't, also, it just doesn't seem more complicated to me, but um, um, th this would be like saying, and not that way, I mean, uh, um, Tim Williamson has done a remarkable uh, thing for philosophy by just putting blinders on and holding fast to classical logic and never turning away. I mean, we have incredibly interesting um, uh, theories in epistemology and um, 
counts of vagueness, which are related, um, and so on. Um, but so I don't think I don't think Tim is thinking this, but it it's hard not to see this kind of well, that's more complicated as something like, you know, reality has um, four trees in the in the quad, but it's a much simpler theory if we just recognize the front two. Um, uh, it's almost like it, it's it, again. Let me be crystal clear. Tim Williamson is definitely not saying that. But if he's not saying that, then what is he saying? I mean, if he's saying, look, reality doesn't have those back two. Well, we need an argument for it. And it can't be that that would complicate matters because if, re if reality has all four possibilities, um, how is that complicating reality? It's not, that's just what reality is. It's not more complicated by recognizing what's in reality. Yeah, I mean- Does that um, make sense or am yeah, I- does. No, okay. no, it does. That's good. I mean, on some level, we might say, though, that like, um, well, the world with four trees rather than two, and therefore the theory which posits it is, is more complicated than the world with two theories uh, rather than four, and, and, the, and therefore the theory which posits it. I mean, maybe that's what's going on. It's like, yeah, but then, but so what? I mean, the yeah. whole point is to try to get reality right, right? Not try to get right. like, I mean, again, if you think about it, if it's if it's a matter of, um, and again, let me be clear, Tim Williamson is not sort of slight, but I just am not quite seeing where the objection is at this point, but um, I'm sure he's not saying this, but you, you know, if the idea is to get as few possibilities as possible um, and get the strongest consequence relation as possible, um, then take the trivial entailment relation, which will say that every sentence follows from every sentence. Um, so your theory is gonna have everything in it, but only recognize one possibility, true. Um, <laughs> that's a perfectly simple theory in, in one sense. Um, it's very easy. It's a, as, uh, there's a related point that um, Robert K. Meyer, uh, Bob Meyer, uh, had a paper in the journal of Philosophy a long time ago uh, where he made a similar point, which is that um, you know you can't you can't take simplicity. It's an important virtue of a theory, but you can't take it too far. Otherwise, you know we just we take the simplest uh, theory, which is easy to ax axiomatize. You have this. Uh, variable p that stands in for any sentence in the language and um uh and then i for, I, for, I forget the role uh oh and then it's probably the role is um something like take p as an axiom too right and and mm -hmm. like you know you have this very simple um but entirely trivial theory uh yeah and then on the fourth one um I mean, this is going to turn. Um, where to put this? Um, so Williamson and many other theorists think that um, uh, the motivation for non-classical logics that they um, allow for, like plausibly true non-classical theories, or like Gladi or Gaffey theories, is um, well, obviously contentious. They think that. Um, we are just better off trying to find a consistent um, account of these things. And um, I think we only said mentioned that um, uh, it's, it's always going to be easier to, um, in the case of some, if there is some genuine paradox, it's always going to be easier to give up some commitment regarding the nature of truth or language or something else than uh, entailment relations or something like that. I mean, I, I mean, what do you think about, does that make sense to you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, look, the standard way of dealing with things is, um, uh, you know, um, hold, and again, I mean, you know, Williamson's methodology, which has generated a great deal of interesting um, accounts and theories um, is just, you know, hold fast classical logic and never question it. Um, 
and uh, and then everything else you bend to to sort of fit that, no matter what the consequences. So this is where the um, epistemicism comes from with the you know vagueness. Um, uh, Sorensen is similar, you know, Roy Sorensen, um, and and anyway, I mean. Um, uh, so the standard thing to do is when you have a, um, a particular phenomenon that's difficult to accommodate, uh, it looks like you're just, you, you can't truly describe this thing without contradicting or something like this, then um, you think, okay, no matter how strongly the appearance is, you know, truth can't work that way. Um, uh, so if you have a sentence that says, I'm false, well, truth and falsity just can't work the way we thought they did. Why? Well, because of course, classical logic has to work the way it, we thought it did. It could never possibly not work the way we thought it did, but everything else is up for grabs. And that's the, that's sort of, sort of the Williamson methodology and, um, uh, and again, it's generated some absolutely um, invaluable uh, uh, theories. And um, but I myself, um, I think it's simply incorrect to say that it's easier to do that than I, I just don't get what that would even mean. Um, um, you know, you have some phenomena that look like you're going to leave out important truths if you don't um, have a, a contradictory theory or a glutty theory. Um, or you're going to, um, you're going to have this unmotivated or overpopulated theory uh, if you demand a prime and uh, a prime theory closed under excluded middle, so no gaps. Um, yeah, maybe, may, I mean, maybe our best theory in some areas uh, for some, some phenomena, um, that's, the right, that's the right way to go. But I mean, how, how on earth, I don't, I mean, I truly, I don't know anyone who works on truth who would think it's easier to muck around with truth than um, reassess our, our theory of logical consequence itself. Um, I mean, look at what, you know, Tarski's, what Tarski came up with, with truth. Look at, um, or if you want a consistent account of, of truth, uh, look at Hartree Fields, who, who you know, really didn't want to give up. Uh, he, he didn't want to give up classical logic. Um, uh, but, um, you know, he's... he's uh, but he did, um, you know, because truth, it's much harder to give up the account of truth. I mean, Tarski's just, oh, well, Tarski, he didn't really give an account of truth itself. He was giving an account of truth for formalized uh, languages, but um, what everyone calls Tarski and, you know, the sort of hierarchical um, different languages and all that. Um, you know, as Kripke pointed out, you're just not going to get, um, it, it, you have to so resist the appearances to, to accept something like that. I mean, the way in which we use uh, the term true meaningfully and um, importantly, you have to say, no, that's all mixed up. Despite how much it appears that we're using it that way, it can't be right. Otherwise, classical logic would have to be the wrong account of the universal entailment relation. And that could never be. Um, I just don't sort of, you know, I think it's a worthwhile program to, to take that attitude um, and that methodology that Williamson has taken. I think it's proven itself as a very important methodology in philosophy, but 
as for the truth of the matter, I just don't don't see it. All right. All right. Yeah, that's some some uh, good points there. I think I think I'll move on to some of the other questions I had. Um, but yeah, that was a good overview of some of some of the responses to the at least those criticisms, at least. I'm sure there are, of course, more, but um, uh, you only have so much time. Um, right, right. Uh, let's see here. I did want to ask a question about, um, you've already mentioned that truth is in some sense, or the truth operator is transparent, it's invisible in some way. Um, uh, and you've written on this, of course, um, maybe, to start, could you sort of expand on the view that the truth is a transparent logical property? It's in this, in how that relates to like deflationary views and so forth. Sure. Um, uh, and I'll try to say this in a short <laughs> way. Um, so um, <clears throat> so um, as I said, you have logic gives you two unary operators. It's true that and it's false that. The it's false that is normally called logical negation. And when called at all, uh, the truth operator is sometimes called the null operator or nullation. Um, okay. Um, uh, now, those, by the way, the truth operator is in every single language, just as the falsity operator is, um, every language of every true theory. Um, but some true theories are classically closed that, and, and they're non-trivial. That tells you that, um, that paradoxes don't arise from the truth or falsity operators. So if you just have a truth operator in the language, you're not going to get a liar paradox or anything like that. Because a truth operator, you have to have the sentence before you get a new sentence by applying the operator. Um, and if you don't have a, a paradoxical sentence, then applying it's true that to it is not going to make one. Um, okay. Uh, but now what properties uh, do the truth operator and falsity operator correspond to? Well, um, I think of this as, you know, you, you want some property that mimics the behavior of the truth and falsity operators. And um, so just as truth, the truth operator, it's true that P and P are everywhere intersubstitutable, right? You, they're, they're always intersubstitutable. Um, uh, the truth predicate that's supposed to express a logical property abstracted from this truth operator, you have to have P is true, that sentence, and P everywhere intersubstitutable. So that intersubstitutable um, is the transparency. Um, it's like the predicate is entirely see-through in the way that the operator is. Um, interestingly, and of course, well-known, the predicate, though, is creative uh, in the sense that given the grammar, um, when you have a transparent truth predicate, you get, you know, spandrels of it. You get these unintended uh, byproducts. You get sentences that say, for example, I'm true. Uh, you never had such a sentence if you only had the, it's true that. You'd never get such a sentence. So these, these sort of the property of transparent truth and transparent falsity are just the they're logical in the sense that they're abstracted from the unary logical uh, operators. And um, they are just built to mimic the way the, those operators work. But given the grammar, they sort of wind up going beyond. And that's where you get liar sentences and all that kind of stuff. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I think I think so a little bit, and um, really, <laughs> um, right. And um, you've also in, in one of the papers I read, um, you talked about uh, transparent truth as an as you mentioned sort of briefly here that it's a sort of emergent logical property. 
Mm. Yeah, well, what I must have meant by that, um, oh yeah, in that paper in the Lynch and um, Wyatt and so on, Truth Volume uh, collection um, uh, uh, with MIT, uh, <clears throat> that it's an emergent property in the sense that um, uh, that, that I explained. It's sort of, it, it's defined looking back at the vocabulary of, uh, uh, it's defined looking back at the behavior, the entailment behavior of the, of the operators that it's, it, it's, it's supposed to abstract a property from. Um, so it's, it's that kind of emergent that I, I probably had in mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you've already sort of said something about this, but um, y you define a, like a logical property as one which is expressed by a logical predicate. Um, in some way, though, we might think this maybe pushes the question back. I mean, how are we thinking about what a logical predicate is? Is it, I mean, it's simply the collection of predicates, if there are any that we call logical. Um, you mentioned something about first order logic. I mean, what, what sort of criteria do you have? Right. Yeah, no, that's an important uh, question because it's an important clarification. In fact, I think that there are no predicates in the language of logic itself. So mm -hmm. validity isn't part of logical vocabulary. Um, certainly, uh, th there's a truth operator and a falsity operator, but logic alone does not give you truth and falsity predicates. Uh, um, if it did, then life would be very, very different, um, but it doesn't. Um, so I think that logical vocabulary as the topic neutral universal vocabulary is devoid of predicates. Not only is identity not in there, but um, things like validity, truth, falsity, none of these things are, you know, in the language of logic itself. Um, and after all, predicates are what give us the sort of um, resources to, to say true things about, about things. They're sort of topic rich. They're expressing properties and this and that and the other thing. Um, so you wouldn't expect predicates in the uh, topic neutral vocabulary that's universal to all true theories. Nonetheless, we can certainly uh, have a sense of logical predicate in the following, in the way that I was just talking about. Namely, you're getting predicates that sort of abstract from the logical vocabulary. So the transparent truth predicate, um, how's that, what's its behavior gonna be? It's, it's entailment behavior. Um, well, look at, the, look at the logical operator it's supposed to abstract from. It's true that um, has a transparency to it. That's basically all there is. It's true that P and P are everywhere uh, intersubstitutable. Um, so you want the predicate to have the same thing. And um, so if we think of logical predicates as emergent or defined from logical vocabulary, uh, then, then truth, transparent truth, transparent uh, falsity are logical in that sense. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, then, can I just say one more thing about that? Sure. So, so there's always been a lot of debate about identity as a logical, uh, there's been a lot of debate um, uh, as to whether that's actually logical vocabulary, even though when people learn um, they typically learn classical first order logic. They do it with identity because that, you know, it's useful for various things. Um, but if logic doesn't provide an identity predicate, as I say, then where do we, you know, where does that leave us? Well, I've often thought that part of the hard work in theorizing is coming up with the right identity relation for the reality that your theory is about. Um, they might all follow the sort of Leibnizian recipe of, uh, you know, defining them in terms of a biconditional and 
um, and so on. But um, anyway, I, I don't want to get a sidetrack, but I just wanted to mention, I don't think that logic provides any predicates. We can define logical predicates as derived or emergent, as you said, uh, in the way I indicated. And that means that when we do true theories, we have more work to do than we thought we did. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. And um, you also mentioned briefly how um, from these, um, from the notion of truth as an emergent property, you get these, uh, I think there's something you explore more in uh, one of your recent books on this called The Spandrels of Truth. You get these um, sort of novel um, properties or constructions that you can get out of these things um, that you can't get out of just the more basic things from which they emerge in some sense. I mean, how, how does that really, I mean, work in some sense? I mean, what are maybe some examples or what do you say? Well, I mean, look, um, so an example I gave uh, applies, but think of it. Mm -hmm. So the term spandrel, of course, comes from uh, architecture. Yeah. Um, and it's basically, uh, although Marcus Rosberg, a uh, logician at UConn um, and philosopher of mathematics, uh, knows much more about architecture than I do. And he told me that I'm wrong in every example I give. But anyway, the basic idea is this, that um, you have these things like, suppose you're building, you want to build an archway, but you want it to sort of, you know, look like that. Uh, sorry, um, people listening, won't, but, but imagine an archway where you have various arches linked together, right? You're gonna have these sort of arches come down, column-like things and so on, okay? Um, if you're gonna have that, then, um, you know, one thing that you're inevitably gonna have is the space, the sort of V-shaped space in between the arches uh, up on top. Because if, you're, if your arch is sort of, you know, they, they do like a, a sort of heart-like shape, that's going to leave this space um, up, in to up on top. And that's sort of an inevitable byproduct of the design. Um, the evolutionary biologists um, Gould and Lewontin, um, they applied this idea to evolution. So there are various traits that you might say what is the, um, why did mother nature select that trait? Uh, and apparently, um, you know, this evolutionary biologist can be knocking their head against the wall, trying to figure out like why this, and they pointed out that there are evolutionary spandrels. It's not that mother nature picked that trait, but rather um, uh, picked these other two. And an inevitable byproduct is the trait that you're asking about. So I always point out, like, if you hold up your hand, you know, and you, you sort of separate two of the fingers, why is there, why did Mother Nature select that V shape between, well, you know, she did, she just selected the, the fingers linked just so, and you get a V shape as inevitable. All right. Well, just as you can have spandrels in, um, uh, an evolutionary environment, depending on which environment you put it, you select for. Um, so too with the language, uh, with certain grammatical environments, if you add uh, a predicate that works just so, and you might have very good reason for adding it to the language, there are going to be inevitable byproducts, some of which are going to be unintended. And uh, in the book, Spandrels of Truth, I point out that um, this is where we get liar-like sentences and all that. We have uh, very specific um, needs for a truth predicate. Uh, it can be very quote unquote deflationary or transparent, um, but we bring it in for expressive purposes. But an effect of that are liar-like sentences. I'm not true and so on. Um, if there was no falsity operator in the language of logic, then you wouldn't have that automatically. You might still get other problematic spandrels, but you wouldn't have that one. But because we do have that in the language of logic, 
you get that particular and very well-known um, spandrel, the liar-like liar sentences. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's how they, that's how they arise. And um, yeah, the question is, what do you do with them? Um, and, you know, um, philosophers give different answers. I say, well, let them live. Um, they're not hurting anything. It's an interesting way to put it, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and um, you had, uh, I'll actually move on to another question I had on a different paper, and you had um, um, interesting paper exploring the view that the future is bloody in some sense. Uh, oh, yeah. A sort of dual to the view, the somewhat more common view that the future is gappy, this kind of, um, future tense propositions have no truth value, maybe put it that way. Yeah. And or at least some of them do. Yeah. And um, but more than that, you even consider the view that um, the future is glutty while in some sense the present isn't. The um, future gluts get consistentized in some sense as the yeah. as, yeah. as they yeah. as it flows into the present. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't think you were forwarding this as like your own view, but at least you were you know, considering it and defending it against some objections, objections. Um, and I've, I kind of find this kind of a very mysterious, hard to um, take very seriously. I mean, uh, one, this process of consistentization seems kind of mysterious. And second, um, related to something, uh, for example, Timothy Williamson has said, um, somewhat derogatively um, of David Lewis's mode of realism is that it's effectively a rival cosmology to existing physical theories. Uh, do you think this same sort of critique might be here? Is this, is this the view that the future is bloody and it's like becoming consistent in some sense? Is that in some sense a rival to um, existing cosmologies? What do you think of this? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, that paper, you know, there have been a couple papers like this so far um, where I just thought it was interesting to explore and um, it seemed entirely sort of neglected and it raises certain, you know, it's, it's just kind of interesting. Um, so you're right to think that I wasn't advancing that as my view of the future. Um, um, but what seemed weird was to try to make sense of the idea that, you know, everyone thinks, oh, gappy future, that's fine. You know, you just have all this unsettled stuff and much of the present, forget some of these weird cases, you know, of gluts or whatever, but the present is largely consistent. Um, uh, that is, you can truly and fully describe it consistently. Um, and I thought, you know, well, what about the, the gluts? And I, I remember, I can't even remember who I was talking with, but, but I was saying, you know, there ought to be a, just a, you know, you ought to be able to have gluts in the future. Um, but the trouble is, how do you not have gluts in the present? Um, and, and so you have, you know, the way I do it in that paper is, um, you know, it will be the, the, the tense operators, the future operators are finding sort of glutty future, but at the present uh, things, yeah, somehow get consistentized. Um, I mean, look, um, you know, if physics demanded gaps in the future, uh, which, it doesn't, um, if it, it demanded gaps, then this would be um, a rival view that would maybe knock up against our best science of, of uh, our best phys uh, physics. physics. Um, um, and so I would, and that would be a serious worry. Like there would need to be, you know, um, there would need to be more work done. Um, but 
Um, I don't know. I mean, look, the nice thing is, you know, if you do think that, um, you know, I mean, people think, look, the future can go one of two ways. You know, I'm going to wake up tomorrow or I'm not. Well, a part of this paper just points out that it could be both. Um, it's like the few, as far as the future sees, it can be both just as much as it can be neither. I mean, there's no advantage one way or the other, as far as I can see. Um, but I'm with you. I don't find it to be, you know, I, I don't find it to be too, I, it's not a natural sort of account of the future. It would be interesting to know why it doesn't appear to be natural. Like what exactly is it? And it might just come down to, if the future's glutty, why isn't the present? Um, like, why does it get consistentized? Um, if it's gappy, you don't have that question. I mean, but you might say, well, why, why isn't the present gappy? I don't, I, like, mm. actually, maybe you do get that question. That's actually interesting. Um, I mean, I don't have time to think about it, but that, that's an interesting question. Like, if the difference is you think, well, if the future is glutty, then the present ought to be glutty. Well, why don't you think that about Gappy? Um, like, why, if the future is Gappy, why isn't it Gappy? Why isn't the present Gappy? Um, and you might say, well, because I'm there. But that doesn't tell against, you know, one way or the other, as far as I can see. Um, that's an interesting question uh, for w one of your listeners to um, that, that, that would be interesting. If anyone works that out, I'd be interested in seeing it. Not that I'm thinking much about that, that paper these days, but um, I would be interested in seeing that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, personally, at least it, it seems weird to think that um, these and I guess the sort of logical properties maybe of the future, just of the future and not of the present or the past, whether it be gappiness or, or, or gluttiness. Um, That's a good point, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I, maybe it's because I'm somewhat sympathetic to certain views of time that it's like, yeah, you know, it's just a, yeah, the big it's all block. just one block, you know? Yeah, 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 um, sure, 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 yeah. I mean, okay, there's some, I mean, I guess you might say that in some areas of the block there's, um there's like uh gluts maybe or glutty objects yeah um, yeah yeah but then you're not saying something in like general about the present i mean okay the present now okay the gluts might be future but at some other present <laughs> the yeah. guts are present or past yeah uh, yeah yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, I, I haven't thought about that in a while, but the, the, these are interesting questions. Like in, in what sense does the block view really rule against? By the way, it might be that the block view doesn't ultimately rule against one way or the other. Well, would it, it might rule against uh, gaps um, in a natural way. But um, anyway, whatever the answer is on that, whether the block view rules against gaps, gluts, or both, um, suppose that, suppose that it doesn't, that would be interesting, but it's in no way, therefore saying we ought to accept that the block is, has some gluts in it or gaps mm -hmm. or anything else, but it would be interesting to see whether, um, if you hold the block view, you know, does that force out gaps or gluts? I mean, you sort of tend to think that it would force out gaps and something, but um, anyway, okay. Yeah. Good. Um, some interesting things to think about there anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. I did want to, I think in the last uh, kind of section of the, the interview, talk about some of your um, work relating to um, theology and, and how, um, uh, your views on logic can be applied there and, and one I'll get to your book in a second but one, one paper you have um, explores um, how some statements about God in general might be gappy um, yeah. for example the so-called um, stone paradox yeah um, 
you think, well, that can be just be resolved by simply um, denying that the statement that God uh, um, can construct such a stone, for example, is 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 either true or false. Exactly. Um, exactly. This, so, um, so, yeah, um, maybe if you want to expand on that view, and actually, I noted this that one one comment you made sort of in passing in that paper was that um, God isn't. God is responsible for a logical cons- consequence. Yeah, um, I regret putting that in there. Oh, I, think yeah. that, I think that my co-author, Aaron Contmore, um, actually said, oh, we shouldn't put that in there. And I thought, no, oh, we should put that in there. And uh, I kind of regret it because um, it really is a, is a... So people who work in philosophy of religion or particular philosophical theology or whatever... That, that that issue is really sort of divisive. Mm-hmm. And um, I didn't, I, I sort of should have known better. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I'm still trying to figure out exactly what I think about that. Um, um, whether, you know, um, of course you can't just sort of talk in the abstract. You have to sort of walk on to one particular theological account and then see what the best answer is there. Uh, I, don't, I doubt that there's some sort of uniform account of, um, you know, even to talk of uh, traditional monotheism is, you know, which tends to be like um, Christian, uh, um, Jewish, and um, Muslim, um, and then variations on that, but 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 even there, you're not going to get a sort of common answer on that. So um, anyway, let me just say I regret that question. I find that issue absolutely fascinating. Like whether to say that God um, uh, at least think think traditional monotheism, a God uh, created logical consequence. Um, my understanding, but I'm not a historian, is that uh, um, I think Descartes actually thought as much. Um, but uh, and you know he he might have come up with the wrong epistemology ultimately. But the guy, you know, what he thought is worth uh, taking very very seriously um, in my in my view. But anyway. If we could, let's step away from that footnote. Uh, <laughs> sure. So, so on that paper, just very quickly, yeah, that was a paper I co-authored um, with a, a former student of mine, actually, Aaron Kotmar, who's um, at uh, University of St. Andrews. And um, uh, and yeah, so the typical stone problem is either God can lift a stone to a big lift or, or it's false that God can do so. And we just point out that, you know, um, that there's still no good argument to think that the right account of logical consequence is classical. So, you know, a, 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 um, a, if we take a subclassical account, something in the vicinity of K3, uh, strong plane, um, uh, it's natural to, to just think that that doesn't work. There are issues that come up. For example, how do you express the truth of God's um, omnipotence? Um, and we attempt to answer that. Um, you can't do it with simply logical vocabulary, as we say in the paper. Yeah. And um, yeah, so um, obviously, most of the effort on sort of in theology and philosophy of religion on this matter has been, as you say, trying to provide a consistent account. And um, so like often such accounts will try to, you know, specify the domain of everything or all when they say that God can do everything, you know, all things are possible with God. And, you know, it's gonna, we're gonna say something like, well, explicitly, well, explicitly restrict it to some logical or metaphysical possibility and maybe with further restrictions to deal with remaining issues. Um, do you think there's some philosophical or maybe specifically theological reason for preferring the uh, Gappy account or, or, or was your main goal just to present a viable alternative and defend it against some objections? 
Yeah, the main the main goal is to put it on the table. I mean, as I as as uh, Aaron and I say in that paper, um, you know, I mean, m my own view um, is that uh, the right account certainly involves gluts, at least in Christian theology, and I think Judaic and I believe um, Muslim theology as well. Some papers have come out since some of my work talking about. Um, gluts in uh, Muslim uh, theology. Um, but anyway, um, so, you know, a, co a good colleague of mine and one of the world leaders in philosophy of religion, Mike Ray, um, he, uh, you know, he's often said to me that, you know, if, as I do, you know, I think a glut theoretic account of Christian theology is right, then, you um, I shouldn't go gappy with respect to some of these omni problems. It should all be gluts and that's a more unified picture. I've never been too um, persuaded by that. I think it's you take the cases one at a time and you sort of look at options and then you figure out which is the simplest, most natural. There is something to a sort of unified uh, picture. Absolutely no question about it. But um, I think that, you know, the gappy account, since logic provides that possibility, um, I do think it's natural for some of these things. In a book that I'm doing now, which is a follow-up, um, uh, and, and probably the last book that I'll do in this um, sort of series of things, um, is uh, I'm doing a book on the Trinity, which combined with the other book you mentioned on the uh, incarnation um, in Christian theology. Um, I guess I'm now much closer to thinking that the right story is glutty with respect to, um, but in isolation from what I said about the incarnation and all that with respect to Christian theology, um, I, I don't know how you arrive at that. Uh, answer. Um, but when you look hard at um, the sort of axioms of the Trinity, um, you get um, you get pushed in that direction a bit in, in ways that are unexpected. But I, I don't want to go into that. I'm still writing that. Yeah. 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 yeah so that's an interesting point. Um, um, and and you, I got, I've sometimes thought about, well, on some versions of the, on some accounts of the Trinity, is um, um, does seem kind of contradictory because we're saying that <laughs> something is both one and many. Uh, and exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I, I think you know this is. There are two things in um, in the standard Christian uh, uh, theory of God, which is um, the incarnation um, and the Trinity. So neither Jews nor Muslims accept either one of those things. They still, you know, both have the sort of stone problem and that kind of stuff because God is omnipotent, omniscient. They still have the problem of evil, that stuff, but they don't have specifically incarnation or Trinity. Um, in fact, um, uh, Jews and Muslims, like many atheists and, and even agnostics and all that, um, often point to the incarnation and the Trinity as clear contradictions and, you know, um, but anyway, carry on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, and I, you'll probably explore some, a lot of this in that book is there have been so many different, um, attempts and accounts. I mean, it's, an old doctrine and <laughs> um uh, as with the incarnation um yeah. and i guess i'll ask about the incarnation because again you have that book the Contra contradictory christ which is out this year and yeah they, they effectively defend the view that uh jesus is a contradictory being because there right. are statements that are both true or false of him um, right. he's in the extension and anti-extension of various terms and so forth he's limited and unlimited mutable and immutable and um perhaps many more yep. um yeah, i mean i 
um, I have some questions about that, but maybe um, if that's right and uh, expand on that a few a little bit. Um, okay. Sure. Um, yeah. So so look. Um, the um, so as with any you know uh, um, as with any theology you know often you get different strands and so on but in Christian theology and this is contentious but let me just uh, you know if if it's too contentious take it as stipulation but I don't think it's wildly so there are some councils you know even. Uh, Catholics and Protestants, and then they they sort of go different ways and all this stuff. But um, look, one thing that sort of defines what I take to be standard Christian theology is um, one of these councils, which is the Council of Chalcedon in um, uh, 451. Um, and, and there, not only... Um, what you get is an account of Jesus as not just a human, but divine. And not just sort of divine, like, hey, sort of divine, some like, you know, magical properties or something like this, but actually fully divine. Uh, as so you get stamped. That, that Jesus is um, God. That's, that's what's stamped there. And human. And your immediate reaction, if you're a reflective person, as, as many who bother to sort of listen to any of this would be, is, um, well, that just seems contradictory. I mean, God is limitless. Um, humans are limited. Uh, you know, and there's a cap on what human, on the, on the sort of limitlessness, there's a cap on human limitlessness, um, after otherwise, we, we could be like God, which is a terror, you know, that, that's sort of ruled out on the standard story, you can't, you know, you can be like God in various ways, but not sort of equal or something, but, but Jesus is, uh, fully human, and fully divine, as the saying goes. And um, what that means is whatever features are entailed by being divine, by being God, Jesus has. And whatever features are entailed by being human, including the limitations, Jesus has. Um, so this is the account. Um, and immediately you think, well, there's some sort of contradiction. Um, and now you can think of an easy way around it, right? Well, Jesus isn't really God. It's just sort of a very important chosen figure, a prophet, a very sort of has various divine-like features, but isn't God. That would get around the contradiction. But that's ruled out as, as non-standard, as heretical. It's a heresy, which just means you're no longer on the standard theory of God. Or of the incarnation, um, or you could go the other way. It's God who just looks human, right? Um, or you could say that Jesus is really two different persons. There's a human person, say Jesus, and the divine person, say Christ, and they just sort of, you know, sort of like two persons there, or something like this. Um, that too rolled out as heretical. So sort of. The history of heresy uh, for standard Christian theology really is a history of trying to get around the contradiction of the incarnation. And in this book, I point out that a lot of the quest for a consistent account of Christ is driven by, um, um, you know, an un unfounded view of logical uh, uh, consequence. And... Um, when you look at the problems with um, all of the consistent accounts, they either result in heresy when you look closely, or they simply don't solve the problem. They sort of throw it up 
to mystery or something like this. Um, and uh, so in this book, I simply say, look, the right account is to accept that Jesus is both um, fully divine and fully human and therefore absolutely limitless, but also limited and so on. And in fact, some of this kind of talk is actually in a lot of the church history and some of the, some of the yeah, church history where you have claims like, Jesus is mutable and immutable. I mean, explicitly, it sounds like they're trying to hide this, but then it's like, this is a mystery or this or that. And it can't really be contradictory because reality can't be contradictory. So, you know, we don't understand it, but to give the full story, you have to say he's both. And I point out that's, that's right. You know, to give the full story, you have to give both. And, um, uh, but the result is an inconsistent uh, theory. Um, but, you know, that th that's rare to have a, an inconsistent theory that's the right theory. But, you know, as um, theists have long said, particularly Christian theists, uh, you know, the incarnation is supposed to be a unique radical event, um, like just really out of the ordinary. God walking around sweating and all that stuff like we do. I mean, that's really bizarre. So it's not, maybe shouldn't be that surprising that the true and complete uh, theory of, of uh, Jesus is um, inconsistent. And then the Trinity one um, goes on from there, takes that as a premise and then, but. Right. Yeah, that's a great um, overview. That's some <laughs> um, some interesting stuff there. Like, there have been, as you say, there have been many attempts to um, find a consistent version of the doctrine. Um, some of which, like, undermine Christ's divinity. Some of them undermine his humanity, um, or both. Um, so, for example, uh, I previously talked with Professor C. Stephen Evans, and he hmm. prefers. Um, I think following Kierkegaard, a sort of canonic view, which kind of admittedly undermines Christ's divinity. Um, uh, yeah, exa so. exactly. And I, I think that, so there is, there is, um, you know, if, if, if you don't, if you're not tied to the tradition and so in Christian theology, the Bible is taken to be revelation. So it's like, think of that as, given i mean you might not always know the best way to interpret it or whatever but but that's given um some of the councils like fully divine fully human that's given and then there are attempts like evans attempt to get around the contradiction of the fully divine fully human but constrained by revelation and there are passages in the bible where it says that God pours out, you know, um, and so somebody like Evans would make a lot of that, but my view is you can't, um, I mean, I see no way of squaring that sort of view with actually accepting the view that Jesus is fully divine. Um, um, I mean, after all, um, well, yeah, I'd get too far into it, but um, uh, yeah, so so you're right. I mean, I mean, he would say that he's you know not not sliding into heresy. That is not sliding away from um, from what the standard theory allows. But um, I guess I I just disagree. But the, anyway, that that's maybe for a different venue yeah and and then there's other approaches i mean some people will try to i mean in some sense inflate our metaphysics of natures or properties or related things so that um well we can kind of say these things without it being a contradiction in the relevant sense i, I i've even heard people say things like well when we say that christ is immutable we're saying that like of his divine nature <laughs> or of 
of Christ qua God or something like that. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So um, uh, another sort of leader in the field, um, Tim Paul, spelled P-A-W-L, um, uh, yeah, he has a view that's, um, that is a long, I mean, I think of it as a long, uh, the Kwa lines, even though he also has one of the best um, extended criticisms of Kwa like uh, uh, views. But um, anyway, in short, yeah, he thinks, as I would put it, um, that the fundamental subject of mutability and immutability are these two you know, um, nature. So we're not actually, we're not fundamentally saying that Jesus is uh, mutable and immutable. What we're saying is this concrete nature, which is basically this thing walking around and all that stuff, that that's mutable. And this other divine nature, that's immutable. Um, and those two things are somehow related to Jesus in a way that by charity, we call Jesus mutable and immutable. But, um, you know, if that's what we're saying, then why not just say there's this one thing that is not Jesus and uh, that's, that's mutable. And this other thing that is not Jesus, that is immutable. Um, why not just be clear and say that? Um, and then, you know, and just say, and by charity, we can call Jesus both of those things. But what we're really first, in the first instance, talking about are these other things. Um, yeah, I just don't, I mean, I, I think that, I think if that's what we were saying, that could have been said easier. And, and there'd be not even the slightest appearance of contradiction. Um, I mean, how difficult is it to say, and of course, if you say that Christ is, uh, uh, that Jesus is identical to um, those things, then you get the problem back. But um, yeah, yeah, but no, that's, that's right. And I do think so in the book, I, yeah, I just point out that, you know, a lot of these views are forced just in trying to get around the contradiction, they're forced in, to inflate metaphysics or into these sort of, you know, talking about different things when it looked like the problem was supposed to be talking about the one thing, Jesus. Um, yeah, and, you know, I mean, a lot of this is done because I think insufficient reflection on whether logical space allows for gluts. Um, so each one of these sort of standard ways around the contradiction, all of them acknowledge that whatever the truth is, it's really kind of bizarre. Um, and yet, you know, we go for an even more bizarre one by being really complicated or talking about different things. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I just want to mention like one more approach. I mean, there's obviously sure. more, but let's get your thoughts on it. Um, one, we might say that, um, part of the argument is that, um, uh, you know, a God, God has to be unlimited and a, a human can't be unlimited. What if we just deny something like that and, and say that, um, sort of the essential attributes, essentially divine and essentially human attributes are not actually contradictory in that, well, we could, we could just have something that is um uh man and and god without contradiction i mean maybe we say something like ah to be man is to be some sort of a rational animal or a rational soul maybe and um to be god is maybe to be that plus have these other attributes you know and maybe there's no contradiction there um what do you think of this picture well again um um I mean, we'd have to go th through the picture in detail, really. I mean, here's why. Suppose that many of the 
the sort of limiting the 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 properties that or limited capped properties however you want to look at it that is essential to hu being human um suppose that those aren't there so that in fact the properties that human have humans have are the same properties that god has just maybe to a lower degree okay um so let's just focus on one rather than just have this mess of abstract talk so think about think about omniscience right you might think that hey omniscience is just the sort of limiting case of knowing a lot um but we can know a lot as humans that's perfectly compatible with being human um but my claim is that there's um there's an essential cap on the extent to which you can know. I mean, I, I think that this, this is true for any divine property, any property of God, even if we have the same property, but to a lower extent, there has to be a cap. And the reason is that otherwise there's going to be a possibility. Um, again, I mean, we'd have to go through the details, but just in the abstract, it looks like there's going to be a possibility in which you, Troy, uh, are God, because, I mean, without that cap, there's going to be a possibility in which you have all those. But if there's a possibility in which you are God, um, that's, that's very, very, like, very much, that's heresy of some sort. Like, you're way out of the standard if there's a possibility in which you are God. Um, uh, so that's why I say, you know, um, I see where you're going. I, I think, I think it'd be, I think it's worth trying to work out. Um, but the details really will tell. And in particular, how, whatever is essential to be in humans, how does that relate to what's essential to being divine? If it's the same but to lower degree, well, then you're still going to get the contradiction. If it's the same, um, uh, actually to a lower degree, but possibly to the same degree, then you're going to get heresy uh, or, or something. That, that, that's sort of in the mm -hmm. abstract, anyhow. Details will tell. But Yeah, that's a good point. I, I hadn't, I hadn't uh, considered that. Uh, possible consequence of the of that view that um if there's no uh contradiction and there's no nothing preventing um any human from having the attributes sufficient to be god then you know possibly for any human they are god right yeah um, yeah yeah that's 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 uh so that's sort of the main and of course somebody will say but hold on according to the very theology that we're talking about we do have a human who is God, namely Jesus, who, according to the standard uh, theology, is fully human. But again, I say, yeah, but that was pulled off via contradiction. Um, it, it doesn't sort of change the point that, that, that you have God who is human. Uh, that's pulled off by way of contradiction. Um, uh yeah anyway yeah I, and sort of um uh i have there's so many more things i could ask about this but um um for time i want to ask maybe a closing question on that on this well, sure. why do you think um so for the average person that maybe believes in the incarnation and, and, and christianity um why should they really take this view seriously? Why, why is it um, like theologically significant, if you know what I mean? And um, yeah, what, what, what might you say about that? Um, well, I mean, I don't think there's any argument that's going to convince somebody to become uh, a Christian or a, a Jew or a Muslim or, you know, anything else. I, I can't imagine... Uh, um, 
uh, an argument that is convincing about that. Um, so on the standard, uh, you know, according to the standard um, uh, story in Christian theology, um, and I don't know, I don't know about um, Islam, but, uh, but I know in Christian theology, at least standard story is, um, despite all these arguments for the existence of God and all that stuff, um, you know, the standard story is that it's, you know, you come to accept it by way of revelation or something like this. Um, and uh, so nothing in the work I've done or so is intended to convince or anything like that. Um, um, nonetheless, I think it's, I think it is significant. Um, I think that, um, you know, the history of a lot of theology, maybe not so much uh, Kierkegaard, although Evans thinks it's consistent. So, you know, I don't know. I mean, he's one of the experts, but, uh, um, you know, you had various, various Christian theologians, probably Jewish theologians, um, thinking that there are inconsistencies and then trying to know how to live in the face of them or something like that. But, but, what I think is significant about, about this, this work is that um, I think a lot of the field of standard Christian theology has just been push, pushing in the wrong direction um, when, you know, the, the appearance of contradiction is really strong. Now, you can get yourself to not see it. Um, my colleague, Mike Ray, insists that he doesn't see a uh, a problem with the incarnation but you know when i ask him about that uh I, sorry a problem um a, a apparent a strong contradiction um i don't know if he's the ba best data point because he uh, more than most people have really committed to a bunch of theories understanding the incarnation and this and that but um uh, I think you can get yourself not to see it, but on the surface, it sure does look contradictory. And instead of trying to make sense of it and, um, you know, pursue theological implications of it, if any, you know, the whole pursuit has been to try to get around it. And then just every time you can't easily or very clearly get around it, instead just say, well, it's mystery. Um, like, I, I just don't see how that's helping. So I think the significance of this work is, is just to, you know, try to pave a path where, um, you know, you, you, you don't have to try to get around the contradiction. Um, by the way, all this stuff about apology, like defending the this or that, I don't even see this work as, I, I don't see that stuff yeah. as is really important either because I don't mean to disparage the work being done in that, but it just strikes me that, um, look, people who are seeking the truth about something, they're gonna look deeply at you know all, all these options, whether it's religious, physical, empirical. And it's like, you know, if people are just throwing problems at it, they're doing that out of one of two stances to simplify. Uh, one is just to poke holes in it because you don't care and you just, uh, whatever. And the other is you do care, but you're trying to figure out how that can be. And you think maybe the truth lies elsewhere. And if it's the latter sort, then the sort of goal of defending this or that doesn't matter because you know you're you're trying to get at the truth. If it's the former sort, then and again, this has nothing peculiar to do with theology, or in, it's it's the same for any kind, of, whether it's in philosophy, physics, whatever. Um, if it's the former, then who cares <laughs> whether people are throwing holes, you know, puncturing holes in it? Like so, what? They're not they're not sharing in the work anyhow. Um, but anyway, so the significance is, I think it does pave um, a different path. Maybe ultimately it's the wrong one. I mean, I, you know, um, as far as I can see, it's the right one. And um, 
And as I said earlier, what's been remarkable to me is when you put, uh, again, within the framework of Christ, standard Christian theology, you put the account of Jesus, the incarnation, the event of the incarnation, um, you put that together with the Trinity, and then everything sort of seems to uh, really hang together in surprising ways. Um, but but we'll have to get together again after that book's out. That's a very different, uh, that'll take us in a different direction. Yeah, I'd, have, I'd be happy to do that. But um, yeah, I think that's a good place to, to end off. Um, some very interesting points there. There's a lot of uh, <laughs> uh, points for further discussion. Um, yeah, th thanks so much for for agreeing here and uh, agreeing to be here and, and, and take my questions and provide some of your very thoughtful responses. It's been uh, excellent. Yeah, no, Troy, I think I, I think your questions were remarkably good and um, um, very clearly stated. And uh, I enjoyed talking with you. So I hope that was useful not only to you, but to um, your listeners. <laughs>